What's going on guys? Evan the Dark Souls 2 Enthusiast here for another Dark Souls 2 gameplay commentary. This time we're going to be going through the uh, Huntsman's Cops and um, heading on to the Earthen Peak. We will down the Undead Asylum in this period as well, so we'll be fighting two bosses in this video. And we talk about a variety of other things, which I'm going to introduce right now. So, this time we're going to be talking about uh, little channel updates, you know, the usual feedback on the channel, how we're doing, what things are looking like. Um, because this is a small channel, I have the opportunity to sort of tell people everything and anything about how it's operating and things like that. So I'll show a little bit about that for the people that are, you know, longtime subscribers. Oh. Um, next, I want to talk a little about how Dark Souls 2 information is sort of continually evolving and changing. Um, the rate at which we're getting new information has obviously slowed down from the, you know, the first couple days of release, but we're only a couple weeks into release and people are still finding new things, uh, new complaints, new strengths. So, you know, this is an early upload, an early let's play of the analysis I've been doing by reading the Hello. forums probably. You know, an hour, an hour and a half a day, you know, wasting away, um, reading about Dark Souls 2 as opposed to playing it and or hitting the gym or something beneficial like that. But that's a whole other conversation uh, about my personal life, which probably won't make it into this video. But I'll talk a little bit about um, some information I've got out of the Dark Souls community and how things are looking. So we've got some Mega Mule updates, some Soul Memory updates. Uh, you know, the two most frequent topics in these commentary, it seems, are Soul Memory and Mega Mule. But you know, I'll be touching on those again. I'm going to talk about my thoughts on the Platinum Trophy for this game and, you know, how that will reflect my play in the future once I have the Platinum. I want to talk a little bit about um, some developments with the Dark Souls PC version of the game that's coming out soon, which I will be purchasing and what that'll look like, etc, etc. And lastly, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, hopes and dreams for some future patches. So... Without any more further, uh, further introduction, let me jump right into it. So, with the channel, we're doing pretty well. Um, the views are comparatively low on my Dark Souls 2 content Just compared to my Dark Souls 1 content. I think that has a lot to do with my search tags I'm using in my YouTube uh, videos. I don't have maybe the best search tags. I just kind of listed all the bosses and stuff like that. And I haven't loaded down my description with all the little bells and whistles on the tags because, I don't know, I guess it's not that important to me that people find the channel. But... We're not doing too bad, you know, if I average, you know, between 200 and 400 views a video within three weeks, that's pretty good for this channel, and I'm pretty comfortable with that, although, since I have, you know, a little over 2,000 subscribers at this point, it's a little disappointing that, you know, we're not seeing more views. It doesn't disappoint me, it just sort of anecdotally as an observation, you'd think there would be more, but I guess you can never expect everyone on your sub to watch your videos, but I guess that's why I thought they subscribed, so, I don't know. So, no negativity there, just an observation that I was hoping there'd be better engagement. Um, there's been a lot of good comments and likes slash dislikes on the video, so I'm always thankful for that feedback. Uh, more feedback will be good. This is going to be a long series. You know, we've got probably an hour upload of Thang, and I'm... This is a slow let's play. This isn't a speedrun or something, so... There will be a lot more time to cover a lot more material, so I'm at the point where I'd be happy to take requests on, you know, topics to cover, my thoughts on things, or, you know, questions and answers, stuff like that, so... Just a reminder, if you send me messages or post in the comments section, I would be more than happy to share um, observations. And here you'll see our sort of our first timeline moment, which is, this is Falcon the Outcast. He is the Hex Trainer, the primary Hex character uh, representing that skill, but I don't have the required stats to speak with him, um, as is sort of the... I talked about that in the last video, how I don't like how certain NPCs won't speak with you unless you meet the stat requirements, but I guess that's just a matter of personal taste. So. Once again, that's Falcon. If you are into hexing, he's right there. He's early in the game. So you can access uh, the hex stuff early in the game, which is always nice because I think a lot of people are interested in doing the hex builds. Um, and there probably will be a hex build later on the PC. So let's jump into uh, so some of the new information I have on Dark Souls 2 and some concerns I have about, some additional concerns I have about soul memory and things like that. I know the last video, which... Um, it, it kind of got a little negative uh, compared to some other things, and I don't mean these videos to sound negative. They're just genuine critiques I have of the game, observations, and I'm still playing the Dark Souls 2 a lot. I like it, but I do have longevity concerns, and that's why I sort of uh, bring them up in these videos. So, don't be wrong, this is a great game. I'd recommend the buy to anyone, but with that said, if someone had never played Dark Souls 1, I'd recommend they play Dark Souls 1 before Dark Souls 2, just because I think Dark Souls 1 will be a better experience. I, however, would recommend Dark Souls 1 over Demon Souls for a newcomer to the series because um, while Demon Souls is a fantastic game and arguably the best in the series objectively, I think that Demon Souls suffered from accessibility issues. 
Not so much due to difficulty, but just due to that game was just loaded down with inconveniences and things that were frustrating anyone, quote unquote, trying to do it right. So, some information that's come available to me is kind of the new um, min max, because that's basically what the PvP, PvP community surrounds itself with is, you know, the best possible builds at, you know, the maximum agreed upon soul level, which at this point I don't think still hasn't been solidified, but it's definitely starting to lean really heavily towards 150. Now I know, I know, I realize that the soul level cap has nothing to do with anything right now because of the way soul memory works and it makes your soul level irrelevant. But most of us veterans are still living in the era of Dark Souls um, 1, and thus as a result we still try to design our builds, you know, with certain soul levels in mind. And the reason we do this is because ultimately you know, I noticed that whenever people on the forums recently have been posting builds like, this is their soul level 125 dual swordsman, this is the soul level 150 dual swordsman, you know, so on and so forth. There's a lot of comments like, you know, don't waste your time, soul memory makes, you know, soul level irrelevant as it relates to PvP, etc. And that is absolutely true, and I'm aware of that, and I think most people at this point are aware of that. And yes, this goes into New Game Plus, going into New Game Plus does not make soul memory not a thing. And the biggest problem, which we'll talk about later, is the relationship to soul level, which, as far as we know, there is none. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But if I'm going to post a build, there's really no sense in me... Because um, you see a lot of posts on forums like, hey, what are effective builds? Like, really, if you're not going to PvP, it's find the weapon you like and just get the stats to wield it and then get as much scaling as you want for that weapon and you know get whatever you're comfortable with. Because if you don't tend to stop your soul level at a particular point, you're going to max out everything anyway, so it all just becomes about what you want and the priority and what you want it. So, I think that when you're building a new character um, and you don't have a predestined plan, you're just kind of, you know, playing as you go. I think what's important is leveling your vitality and your, or not, no, don't level vitality, scratch that completely. Uh, I keep confusing stats. I wouldn't touch vitality at all um, for new players. I don't think being able to carry certain items, uh, armors and weapons is really all that important early game. I think the emphasis should be on getting your uh, vigor up. I think new players are going to want to get vigor to 20 as soon as possible because prior to 20 the investments into vigor are amazing. After that it's kind of gravy points because it doesn't scale very well, but if you're a new player definitely try to get your vigor up quickly because you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to roll through everything and it's it's going to be challenging. So the next thing I would recommend getting is, you know, obviously raise your stats, your strength and your dexterity to the weapon you want to wield. For many players, that will be the Fire Long Sword. For many other players, that'll be the, the Hildi or Hade Sword, I don't know it's pronounced, but, you know, those those are good choices, too. Um, I recommend using those early game and then transitioning to a weapon you like. Um, finding the weapon you like will be a matter of trial and error and going on the forums and looking at what other people like. So I can't really offer any advice there, but I can say that I found strength weapons to be a little stronger in the PvE environment than in the PvP environment, so... There's that. Um, I've also found magic and faith to be very effective. Fair warning though, magic starts off slower than faith. Faith starts out very powerful very quickly, and magic gets extremely powerful towards the end. I think in terms of fighting bosses and things like that, um, magic allows you to cheese and make many of the difficult fights of the game extremely easy, but only after you have the right spells, and getting those right spells can be confusing for new players who aren't following a guide and things like that. So. I think Faith is an excellent choice for a starting character build once again. It's accessible, it's easy to use, it, perverse, it preserves some challenge while it sort of lessens the difficulty of the early game. Um, so, Faith is a great choice for new players and veterans alike because who doesn't like to throw sunlight spears and things like that. So, that's my thoughts on starting classes and stats to invest in early on is, you know, endurance to 20, you know, vigor to 20, maybe even 30, and then at that point, you know, stats for whatever weapons you want to wield. And you have to prioritize and raise those as you need them. Everyone plays differently. Uh, if you're a new player, raising adaptability may not be the best idea. Not to say adaptability isn't useful because it is, but how useful it is is still kind of depending. And the other thing adaptability is I don't think it has as immediate and measurable effects on your gameplay as the other stats do. So those are just my thoughts. And I think raising a stat to increase your damage should be the lowest priority um, on basically any build. And I'll talk about that a little later. That's not just for new players, that's for all players. But particularly for new players, because I don't think the scaling in this game is very good at all. Um, of course, scaling refers to, you know, you raise your dexterity 
If the weapon gets stronger off the dexterity stat, that's your scaling. Scaling is the damage you receive from stats. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can slice that, and different upgrade paths will do different things to that scaling, etc., etc. And that's sort of beyond the scope of this video uh, at this time. More so, just want to talk about some observations I've made that kind of makes me feel like I'm playing Demon Souls again, and I'm not real sure I'm crazy about that. As much as I like Demon Souls, man, er, I, I don't know. Same with Dark Souls. It's like a, it's the, we're reaching this point of I feel like it's a hybrid between Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 1, and I'll elaborate on what I mean. So. Essentially, in Dark Souls 1, almost all weapons, now admittedly, not all weapons, but almost, almost all the weapons, excuse me, uh, audio cut out there, all the weapons are utilized um, light weapon or curse weapon. Basically, that was a simple weapon buff, and no one really necessarily made requirements for those buffs. So, point of reference, um, in, Dark, in Demon Souls, light weapon, which is basically magic weapon, scaled off your magic stat. So if you're going to do light weapon, you'd raise your magic to, say, 30, and that would scale extremely well. Um, then you wouldn't really take your magic any higher because it wouldn't scale very well after that point. So that was the whole light weapon thing. Curse weapon actually just added a set amount of damage regardless of any stat investment. So some builds wouldn't invest anything beyond you know, the minimums to cast a Curse weapon, and others would raise magic significantly higher so they could cast light weapon. That was uh, how that worked. No one ever actually worried about the requirements to use their catalyst or talisman or you know other medium for casting spells because, frankly, there's just no need. Because the strength of the scaling was not in any way tied to actual um, stats for first weapon, and if you could cast the buff, it didn't matter the strength of the talisman, uh, at least for curse weapon. For magic weapon the strength of the talisman actually mattered. Anyway, that's all background to where we are now, so no need to belabor that point. So in Dark Souls 1, the optimal build for a long time was typically, you know, before patches was get the minimums to use a weapon, make them elemental, which in Dark Souls 1, elemental basically meant you weren't scaling off a stat at all, it was just a set damage. So you could say just get the minimums to use your weapon, make it a lightning weapon, then boom, you're good to go. You can sink all the rest of your points into Endurance and Vitality, which was excellent early game and turned out to be, you know, an in-game build all the way through the Dark Souls 2, or rather Dark Souls 1 PvP and PvE meta. You know, the quote-unquote Vitality Gouge builds were always a thing. And they were a thing going all the way back to Demon Souls, where there were a couple weapons in Demon Souls. Basically, most notably, was Northern Regalia, where, you know, the weapon didn't scale off a stat, so you would just get the minimums to wield the weapon and then you know, gouge vitality once again, or in this game, gouge vigor. Basically, dump as many points as possible into HP, which, you know, frankly, has always been a viable build, and it needs to be a viable build in this game. But I think with some new information that's coming out, um, it's starting to look like that's going to be the sort of the OP build again. So players have been making an observation that, you know, a quality build, as I've talked about this before, quality build refers to taking strength and dexterity, raising them equally for weapons that scale off both strength and dexterity. So, Sun Sword is a great example of this game and a very popular quality weapon. Um, essentially, the Sun Sword scales off of strength and dexterity both equally at A scaling in both categories. So, thus, players equip it and rock it, and you know it's no problem. And then they can set strength and dexterity both to 40, which is where those stop scaling, or a little earlier depending on preference. And there's a lot of different ways to approach that angle, but essentially, that is how players played with it, um, or play with it now. And with some recent testing that's coming out from basically PvPers, PvPers are the people that worry about this kind of stuff. PvE players, they, they don't have as much to worry about really because ultimately if your build can beat the game and can beat New Game Plus, you know, your goals are met. And that's basically, you know, how things appear. So, with that said, um, you know, the, the PvP community obviously is depending on who you are, your perspective, either a bunch of whiners or a bunch of people that want a lot of balance in a game that doesn't have balance. So, let me take it back and do a broader spectrum analysis of the Dark Souls quote-unquote metagame slash plain Dark Souls period. All builds are not equal, okay? All builds have never been equal, in my opinion. You know, there is a reasonable balance between builds to a point, but ultimately there are a couple builds that sort of bubble to the top as being strictly better than others. And that goes for both PvP and PvE. The differences in what you see in those builds is mitigated by individual player skill, which is very difficult to measure. 
luck, certain enemies being weak to certain things. It's hard to get a fully objective analysis that you could substantiate. A lot of it will wind up coming down to opinion. You will find players in Dark Souls 1 that will attest that katanas are not the best weapon class. Now on the flip side, most players agree dexterity weapons, specifically katanas, are the best weapon. I happen to be in that category, but they were not so overwhelmingly the best that they completely busted PvP or PvE wide open. They were just sort of the easiest option, and thereby, objectively speaking, the best, if you measure quality in terms of ease. Which is probably the only objective analysis, because there's no way to assign a value to personal preference. You could try. You know, anecdotally, I think people prefer long reach to short reach, and things like that. I don't know. Fast weapons and slow weapons, because you leave yourself open less. Who knows? Uh, and this guy's gonna come up here and maul me in a second. It's pretty embarrassing. That's a, you know, once again with Dark Souls, every time you die, you're kind of like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have died to that, but I did, and that sucks. So I kind of run away and do a greed heal here. He catches up to me, and I misjudge my roll distance and think I can roll away from that. His weapon's too long. I get picked off, and then we reload back up to here. So, as I was saying, um. With that in mind, I think the bubbling build at the top, for PvP at least, looks to be um, minimal stat investment builds, so then elemental scaling, or raw scaling. Basically, because, and I, you know, I don't have the numbers, the hard numbers on this yet, I've only got some anecdotal observations I made from forum posts and from other people's YouTube videos, it kind of appears as though, if you've got the time and the energy to farm it correctly, the optimal builds are, say, you know, you make a, let's use long swords for an example. You know, I don't think that anyone would attest that long sword is the best weapon in the game. I certainly don't think it is. But long sword's a good starter weapon. Everyone's familiar with the move set. So, I'm like really struggling with this guy. And they're not that hard. He keeps dodging the backstab attempt though. It's like that AI too strong. It's like PvP. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get him on that one, but um. Some I find this fight highly, like, highly distracting, like, man, this enemy should not be that hard. Sometimes you're just overcomplicating it and finally get behind him for the backstab. There's a psychological element there, because he's killed me once, now I'm, I'm hypersensitized slash fearful, so I don't want to, uh, you know, get greedy and just start swinging at him and get killed. I mean, probably would have saved more time if I just went for it, and if I died, just run back and try again, but whatever, it's over now. Um... So relating back to what looks to be the optimal build for me, and this is, you know, a PvP argument. I don't know what's best for PvE right now, and honestly, I don't think it matters. I haven't seen any weapon type that's so distinctly better than others so far that they're sort of the go-to for PvE. But, you know, everything, at least in the community's eyes, tends to be ultimately one of being balanced against the PvP side. I'm not even convinced there's a huge PvP community in the Souls games. I mean... Admittedly, I think many players do play PvP or get invaded or try it for a while, but I don't think anybody gets really serious about it. And, you know, that's fine. It is, however, sort of an observation about what's going on. So, when I talk about these balancing changes, I know a lot of players have been saying, like, you know, I don't really even play the PvP, so I'm not really worried about it. And that's fine. But I think, objectively, when we look at these games, we need to say, like, what will make the game better as a whole? Because just because it doesn't affect you, doesn't mean it doesn't have a profound impact on the longevity and the entire playability of the game. I mean, nobody really wants to be playing a game where nobody else is playing. At least not for any kind of online element. So, the better the game is balanced for online play, the more people are likely to play it. And, once again, I, like any reasonable player, accept that this game is not balanced around the PvP. It will never be a PvP-balanced game. It is not a fighter, you know? It gets equated to a fighting game often. But it is not a fighter, and I don't think FromSoft is looking to balance the game against the wishes of an online environment. At least the decisions they've made haven't reflected that so far, in my opinion, for Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, or Dark Souls 2. Eventually patch notes came out for Dark Souls 1, which to a point would lead me to believe that they were more interested in the, um, in the PvP community, but... Even still to a minimum, it's, it's a PvE game, and I think that anyone that doesn't want to play it as a PvE game is probably playing the wrong game. I, you know, I think there's other options out there for you know, a good combat system with good responsive controls and things like that. Um, and frankly, if you're looking for a more balanced PvP environment, I would argue that you know, Dark Souls 1, in my opinion at this point, is a better PvP environment. 
if there's players still playing and it's still active. I haven't actually checked. But with that said, that's also a matter of opinion. Some people swear that Dark Souls 2 is a huge step in the right direction. Of course, all these analysis ignore the the bastard devil of soul memory, which basically corrupts any chance this game had of having a good PvP community. In my opinion, once again, and we'll talk more about that later. We've got too many topics going on here at once, so to try to narrow our focus, I want to get back to you know what preliminary testing is showing to be to be the best build, you know, at a particular level with the smallest investment. Basically that comes from the fact that scaling is really bad. So if you have S scaling on a weapon, you'd think that it would scale extremely well, but it, it really doesn't. And beyond a certain point, your stats don't contribute a lot to the damage. Um, that cutoff is usually a hard 40. Anything past 40 is not investing in for the damage at all. Which is why the chime, of the chime set for clerics, the dragon chime is so controversial, because you need 50 faith in order to use it. And 10 points of those faith aren't really going to do a whole lot for you, other than qualify you to use the, to use the chime. And nothing else will require that much faith except some miracles, which frankly aren't very good. I mean, Sunlight Spear is pretty good, but you could just spice that down pretty easily. Um, and Blinding Bolt and things like that. Actually, actually not the right name, but the final faith miracle is difficult to use, cumbersome, and frankly not all that great. So, ultimately, um, not try not to go too heavily into scaling is looking like it's the most optimal build. But we're gonna fight the Executioner's Chariot here. He is the boss of the Undead um, Asylum, or rather, Undead Purgatory. So I'm gonna mute myself here, let you guys watch this fight, and we'll talk a little bit more after.
Right, and so ends the Executioner's Chariot, um, one of my favorite boss fights in Dark Souls 2. I have great memories of it from the beta. I was in the Dark Souls 2 beta. Uh, I never uploaded footage from it because it was technically against the terms of service agreement, or terms of use rather, and thus I don't violate those kind of things, uh, at least not, you know, not knowingly. So, anyway, that's why I never saw any Dark Souls 2 beta footage. So, this was the area, by the way, you got to play in the beta was the uh, Huntsman's Cops. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, we're coming up on. You know, Titchy Grin, who is the Brotherhood of Blood, which is basically the dark race of this game. They're all about invading and fighting and stuff like that. So, anyway, that's what we're coming up on. So, the next uh, thing I want to talk about and wrap it up is sort of the new min maxed optimized build, at least what it's looking like to be in the preliminary. And there's a couple different ways to approach it. There is um, Satyr's Spear, or I'm sorry, I think it's Santir's, uh, Santir's Broken Spear is a top build right now in my opinion. Um, spiced um, buffed elemental builds are amongst the top builds and basically anything where you don't have to invest a ton of points into a stat to get the damage um, looks to be the optimal build and we will talk about this and this was a big fear um, about balance when the game was coming out and I feel like we're back in the era of Dark Souls 1 so let me talk a little bit about these builds and the upgrade paths that govern them and why they wind up being um, sort of the what looks to be the OP version of what they are. Like, why are these things OP? Well, I'll do my best to elaborate on why, and it's kind of tough to explore right now because I don't fully understand this topic myself. I've only looked at the numbers, and I haven't had enough time to test, you know, 15 different builds to really get my personal play experience with all these because, frankly, when you're not a Mega Mule user, it's it? really difficult and takes time to make builds accurately. And you know, basically have to do oh. run-throughs of the entire game uh, pick up numerous items along the way to get these builds put together so it's not necessarily the quickest thing in the world but real quick you'll see me warping back here to um, the Tower of Flame and that is so I can go visit the Covenant of Blue uh, the Blue Sentinels rather because um, I now have the required item to Trans join their order you have a thus I can get a gesture from them you and I actually intend to sort of role play quote unquote or in other words I'm just gonna my character will basically die Richard. in this Covenant once I'm ready for it. So that's what we're taking care of right now. And I should also mention this is the guy you can buy uh, bolt stones from. And those bolt stones are you how you make no weapons that scale with here. lightning, and lightning scales off faith. So he's a great vendor uh, for faith players, and it's a great covenant for faith, period. For it is probably is the, the quickest way to unlock Wrath of Gods aside from pride. going through all of New Game Plus. And I have not personally used Wrath of Gods on a character, but I've watched it used in PvP pride. and. I've used it on a buddy's account, and I've got to say that Wrath of Gods is pretty sweet. But, alright guys, um, let's jump back on this weapon thing, because I want to wrap up that topic, because honestly I'm a little tired of talking about it, and we'll know more once more information becomes available. So, first let's jump into the Santir Spear, which is maybe the best weapon in the game. If it's not the best weapon in the game, it has the best moveset in the game. And since moveset typically governs usability of a weapon in the long run, might honestly just be the overall best weapon and to part of me hopes it is because it sort of requires an original build and it also scales well with any level of soul any soul level it's a great weapon at and we'll we'll talk about that here too so what makes C tier spear so good is that basically it it has no natural scaling on its own so really your reinforcement options consist of raw whereas raw would remove all scaling but it already doesn't have scaling which adds just a base 6% damage to the weapon. So, a uh, raw Satyr Spear is pretty good. Um, I, of course, I'm referring to the true spear, and that'll make more sense if you ever see a Satyr Spear. You actually have to break the weapon. Yes, run its durability to zero, and it becomes a whole new weapon. But, regardless, um, the Satyr Spear broken has the move sets of a spear, a halberd, and a twin blade all in one. So, it's an amazing weapon. I don't have a character spec to use one, but I have tinkered around with it, and I have to say it's really fun and arguably one of the top 10 best weapons in the game I think hands down so since I said before scaling slows down pretty quickly um, the best way to use a Santier Spear as far as I can tell is actually to do Mundane. Um, mundane is an infusion that was not all that well understood until recently and very few players are using it or testing with it at least in my experience but the way mundane works is it halves the weapon's damage, which automatically makes people kind of scratch their head, and it adds scaling to all stats. Um, 
More specifically, it gives you sort of S scaling in the lowest stat, which is the highest scaling, and E in all other areas. So, more or less what this means is, and the easiest way to think about mundane is, it's going to scale with your lowest stat. So if you can keep all your stats equal, or close to equal, you can get some really insane damage on a mundane weapon. I mean, obviously the applications for extremely high soul level characters is self-evident. You know, once your soul level gets high enough, all those E and scalings plus S on your lowest stat will create an outrageously damaging weapon. So, mundane will be the chosen path for all ultra late game characters. Now, it's still viable for a soul level 125, 150 character in that you just have to make pretty much a jack of all trades build to use a Santir spear and it, you know, it does damage that's comparable to many other weapons uh, given the speed and moveset, but it definitely doesn't keep up with other weapons. Um, of course, you want to put a weapon buff on it. Normally, that winds up being, you know, something like flame sword or something like that. Flame weapon, excuse me, which is a pyromancy, which is why it's a natural choice. But uh, that's a new game plus thing. So, anyway, it looks like people who are doing the tests for the sort of a min minimization, maximization on damage have found that your best bet to make a weapon um, out damage others is actually to, since scaling isn't that great, it's actually to make an elemental weapon. Uh, with a bolt stone or with something like that and from there you wind up just putting the same elemental enchantment on it so um, it's, I'm having a hard time sort of conceptualizing it for you guys but essentially what the testing shows is that if you have sort of a let's just take any weapon let's take a washing pole for a katana that's a popular weapon people like it hold over from Dark Souls 1 I think it kinda sucks in Dark Souls 2 anyway you take the washing pole and, you know, one method would be to go up to 40 decks because it scales with decks. Or, you know, let's take another weapon. Take, like, the Sun Sword, which we mentioned earlier. You know, it's got A scaling and Strength and Dexterity. So if you take Strength and Dexterity to 40, you know, it's presumably a lot of damage. And it is. However, that's 80 stat points or, you know, a little less, give or take, 60 to 80, depending on which starting class you were. Anyway, the point is, it looks like people that have done the research on this and kind of reflects that... Apparently, and as frightening as it may be, <laughs> frightening is probably an exaggeration, but it's sort of at least disheartening as, as I found it, you get better damage for far less of a stat investment if you just get the base requirements to wield a weapon. Then you stick either, you know, a bolt infusion or a dark infusion, you know, lightning um, or fire or something like that, which will automatically add damage to it, of course, because it's split damage, and uh, at that point, you will go ahead and basically put a matching buff on it. So it sounds complicated right now. It's really not. So now I've not tested this myself. This is all from theorycraft from reliable sources. Uh, there's no weapon calculators up to my knowledge. If somebody wants to elaborate on the comments if they know a little more than I do. But this is just what I've heard and I want to share it with you guys. And it sounds right. And what I've seen in game kind of reflects this that because the scaling bonuses you get for raising your strength and dexterity kind of sucks regardless of what the rating on the weapon is. It's the same problem as Dark Souls 1, which we talked about earlier with class builds, is that you're better off keeping the scaling stats to a minimum because you don't get that much damage anyway. So you wind up taking, let's take um, Faith for a Sunlight Blade, for example. Um, Sunlight Blade's a buff. So instead of taking you know, 40 Strength, 40 Dexterity for your Sun Sword, you get the minimum requirements for your Sun Sword, then you put a Bolt Stone in it so it's scaling off your Faith. Yeah, your Faith stat's going to be really low, but it's still going to add the Faith damage. Uh, it's still going to add the modifier, so you're going to get a little extra lightning damage. And then, because the strength of Sunlight Blade or Dark Blade and things like that isn't greatly proportional to the stats in that magic, you essentially want to buff it with the same element, not a different element. You don't want to split between three defense types because you start lowering your damage. So, in a nutshell, people have found that in testing, in, you know, quality weapons, you know, 40 strength, 40 dexterity, it's actually a much cheaper stat investment and just as damaging, and very similar damage, and sometimes even more damage is to, you know, make your weapon, say, lightning, and then sunlight blade it with minimum faith, and you actually wind up with a higher overall damage rating for far less stat points, if not higher than very, very similar. And obviously, that speaks to itself as that's a balance problem. You're getting way different investments for different stats, and that was the same problem that happened in Dark Souls 1, where it wasn't worth, initially worth raising your scaling stats. Instead, it was better just to make an elemental weapon and run with that. So, 
that's kind of how it looks. It's kind of the, the same mistake in weapon balance from Dark Souls 1 reaches a new generation in Dark Souls 2. That's what it looks like right now. Um, it needs further testing, and I haven't seen any definitive videos on the subject. I'd like to put one out, but probably by the time I get around to crafting such a video, somebody else will have already demonstrated. But the premise is simple. Um, more damage, less stat points is infuse a weapon with an element, and then regardless if you have the stats to make that weapon good, you just go ahead and rock it, and then you do a sunlight blade on it or something like that. Now I know the question that's being asked is, it requires a certain faith requirement to cast Sunlight Blade, and this is very true. And the, tr the answer to that is, you actually wind up uh, spicing, because you can use Skeptic Spice, or dip if you want to use Magic Weapon, or Simpleton Spice, to basically reduce the spell requirements of, the stat requirements of a spell. You know, this is old news of course, and it's potentially game breaking if you're willing to farm a lot of spice to make it a thing. Because you can lower it so Sunlight Blade only requires, you know, the minimum amount of faith, which I I don't know. It spells cap at a certain point. I think you need a minimum number of faith. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I think you can... Basically, if you have the minimum faith to build a catalyst, or it's not even a catalyst in this game, to wear a chime, equip a chime, you can actually cast Sunlight Blade with, you know, the minimum of stats. And you don't even need... Um, Actually, this is wrong. You just need the minimum stats to cast your Miracle. So you lower it as low as you can, and then you get your faith to whatever that point is, and then you go ahead and cast Sunlight Blade. And because the strength of the buff doesn't actually scale with the chime you're using, you can just equip any chime, even if you don't meet the stat requirements, and you can still cast it. Thus, you wind up with a really broken system where... It's almost, like I said, it's a mix of Demon Souls and Dark Souls, because in Demon Souls, the issue was you could take Cursed Weapon, and use a talisman you didn't even have the stats to cast cursed weapon with or to use the talisman to cast cursed weapon used it anyway with a broken talisman and you had a really powerful weapon buff okay the same is true here where you don't actually have to have the stats on your chime to use sunlight blade or the stats for your catalyst to cast you know great magic weapon or crystal magic weapon because you've lowered the requirements of the spell with spice and you don't need to meet the requirements of the item itself to cast the buff I mean, admittedly, your magic stat will be low, or in this game, rather, your intelligence will be low, or your faith will be low, but it won't matter, because it's still going to add damage regardless. So you wind up with low-scaling elemental property combined with, you know, the base weapon strength coupled with the buff, and that winds up being damage comparable to... <laughs> comparable, comparable to... Comparable, if not greater than, you know, a properly skilled, you know, min-maxed, 40 in a damage stat, or 40 in two damage stats kind of thing. So it's definitely um, an imbalance in terms of soul level to power. At least that's what it looks like right now. Uh, we'll see how that shapes up once more weapons are tested, because some weapons change depending on how they're upgraded and things like that. But ultimately, I think it does go to show you that this game needs a lot of work and weapon balance, and that's sort of an, an old motif, if you will. It's been common knowledge for some time that you know we need we need probably better balance in this game. Better fixes with the soul memory, we need better fixes with the weapons, things like that. That is if we want to make, quote unquote, you know, the game as optimal as it can be. Uh, Dark Souls 2 is a great game, you know, I'm having so much fun with it, and I think, you know, in general people are satisfied with it as a sequel. It's just at the same time, to make it the game it could be, to make it the true successor to Dark Souls 1, where we could have probably a better game than Dark Souls 1, we need to fix some of these issues. Like, we need to fix our weapon balance. And you'll see that was a timeline moment there, where we actually got the, uh, key to the undead lockhouse there, so um, that'll be the continuation of several plot lines and things like that. But we're coming up on another uh, timeline moment here in a couple minutes, so we'll see what that looks like. Um, we're actually going to get invaded by Merciless Rowena, I believe. Ah, there we go. And so we're going to slay her. She kind of engages you on this narrow ledge, so it can be very dangerous if you haven't killed all the... Uh, random trash behind you, all the random mobs, but, you know, essentially, uh, I happen to be blessed with lightning spears, which are great, so as you can see, I'm just kind of helping her with lightning, uh, lightning spears as she comes at me, I mean, there's a lot of ways to deal with her, you can just push her off the cliff if you want, but she has some item drops at a very low percentage of dropping, but if they would drop, it'd be tough if you lost the body off the cliff, because then you couldn't retrieve them from the corpse, so, anyway, that, uh, not too hard of an invasion. She's also easy to stun lock with most weapons, so just about anything will deal with her. The important thing is that you don't get mobbed by too many enemies at one time. But 
Um, so I want to wrap up with, because we're going to come up on the boss fight, which will take us mostly to the end of the video. And yeah, as usual, it would be my custom to not talk during boss fights. But I kind of want to throw this out there um, in regards to the soul memory thing. So as you guys know, I'm, I'm big into the PvP, which I've already said. The game isn't balanced around it, and not everyone is into the PvP. But I think ultimately players that play this game for extended lengths of time all dabble in it, or at the very minimum, find it interesting. And thus, it's important to and to keep the community large and keep the community interested, I think it's important that we you know, make the PvP all that it can be. I mean, it kept a lot of people playing in Dark Souls 1. And you know, my thoughts on the soul memory thing are well known, but you know, while soul memory was already a problem and already a, a broken mechanic uh, that didn't do much to, it just sort of limited the community's ability to play together, at least in my opinion, I mean, it basically disallowed the community from creating their own soul level ranges and the developers kind of made it so it's more wild wild west um, and how it operates at least in my opinion and where this has really gone downhill is because soul level is no longer an active or at least a, of minimal influence and you know let me preface remember guys no one really fully understands the soul memory formula I mean, we're going off test done by wiki members we're going by snippets of information provided by FromSoft Overall, though, Namco Bandai, overall, we don't really have the full picture of how it works, and that kind of taints any review anybody makes right now. So we're just going with the information we have because we don't have a choice. But one thing we've basically confirmed is soul memory definitely trumps soul level in terms of matchmaking. And with the onset of the Mega Mule, which is never going away, because now that it's been introduced into the community, there's no way to get rid of it unless the developers put in some sort of server safe checks, which I don't, I don't think is going to be a thing. So... We'll see how that turns out, but since Mega Mule is likely here to stay, trying to ignore it is just, it's pointless. I mean, and considering there's been hacked saves for Demon Souls and Dark Souls, you know, hacked mule accounts available to the public, you know, it's, it's well known that this is a thing. I mean, even if FromSoft implements banning, um, you know, banning system, players will still be trading some of the duped items amongst each other. You know, at this point, the damage is done. It's just, how will the company minimize the damage? And... I think messing with the soul memory mechanic is their best bet at this point because, you know, if you go play in a Brotherhood of Blood arena or, you know, Blue Sentinel arena at this point, you better believe you're going to run into Mega Mulers there. And because the matchmaking is based off soul memory, you wind up in a really bad situation. I mean, you know, I've seen videos of people getting matched, you know, with level 50 characters against max level enemies, um, max level phantoms and things like that because it's based off soul memory. And since the Mega Mules have zero soul memory, no soul memory at all. You know, the minute you kill one enemy, you actually have more souls than, you know, an account that has max souls. I mean, so basically, because the account is hacked and they start with, you know, enough souls to go to max level right out the get-go with completely upgraded all items, you know, they're at basically the perfect position. It's, it's like having the ultimate advantage in any PvP engagement that goes through random invasions or matchmaking in the arenas. You'll see here, we're going to talk to a Crichton who's got a... Uh, Quest, and he's another timeline moment, and this is also the bonfire that's closest to the Skeletor Lords, the last boss of Huntsman Copes. I thought you'd have Cops. Yeah, this, this is a huge problem, I can't stress this enough, when you have so many things tied to these Covenant rewards, and these Covenant rewards have really high requirements. You know, couple this with the fact that the Mega Mule is now introduced into the community, and Soul Memory actually has strengthened Mega Mules. You know, the point of Soul Memory, one of the many points of Soul Memory, was to, you know, basically prevent twinking, both, um twinking both ways and you know those kind of accounts basically you know I've talked about this before they're basically characters with extremely low soul levels with in-game items and the premise was a very skilled player could play through the game with crappy items and never level up their character get to the good items and stay super low level so then they'd be you know an OP deliberately designed twink character so those players could go do co-op and absolutely destroy you know, the bosses, because the bosses aren't balanced for you to have a plus five lightning weapon in the first five minutes of the game. So it made bosses trivial for new players that summoned twinks. And then on the flip side, getting invaded by a twink was almost certain death, because, you know, most players won't have the equipment they need to even stand a chance against a player like that. And I know there's arguments like, well, you can defeat any level of equipment with skill, and eh, to a point that's true, but not really. I mean, you know, if you're early game and you're using, like, a you, know, you don't even have the embers yet to get high level weapons, and definitely not the stats to get high level weapons. So, you basically need an elemental weapon, and unless you've twinked your own character, you know, lightning elementals and fire elemental weapons are not available 
in the first couple hours of the game. And if, to make them available, you have to go out of your way to do it. You have to basically be deliberately trying to get early stat scaling weapons, which only a veteran player would do. So thus, if you are not properly geared, beating a twink is going to be extremely difficult, unless they have no idea how to play Dark Souls whatsoever, which I suppose can happen, but overall is, I think, more of a rarity. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't take rocket scientists, you know, it's not... It's, it's funny how people in the community will dispute things that, you know, in my opinion, are really simple. I mean, players will assert that, you know, it's, it's all about the skill, and it's just really not. So we're going to go silent here for the boss fight. Still marks the end of one of the easiest bosses in Dark Souls 2, the Skeletal Wards. Very interesting mechanics, a fun fight, but not really a challenging fight at all. It gets even easier if you have a weapon that has a large striking rate so you can take out all the trash skeletons, you know, without incident. But as long as you play patiently and you don't try to, like, you know, the best way to screw up that fight is to kill multiple lords at once. There's just so many ads running around, so many little guys that you know, the big guys suddenly become threatening. So that's definitely something to avoid. Or if you've got, like, end game AoE miracles or magic, then you can just. You know, blow them up instantly with like a wrath of gods or something so a lot of ways to approach that fight none are particularly challenging so we're approaching the end of this video and i didn't get to touch on a lot of things i wanted to touch on because there's just not enough time you know it's funny 50 minutes of dark souls there's still not enough time to cover all the dimensions of this game and where it is right now which i think speaks tributes to how great the game is uh, in terms of quality i mean you just have to look at what you're doing and you, wow you know this game is actually so good that hours of conversation about it and there's still more to talk about but most of that conversation actually comes from you know the pvp community which is why i hope it's getting more love than i perceive that it's gotten thus far in the development cycle and i mean you know with that said uh, there's easy ways to choose your pve character where you can get your character geared to just crush the single player in this game you know, in as little as a couple hours and 
you know, I'd, is that something people are interested in doing, is me uploading a series on, you know, how to quickly gear your character to absolutely crush uh, in PvE? Because this series was more of a, you know, how to play through a cleric at a comfortable pace while still getting geared and, you know, sort of well endowed in a character quickly. You know, this is sort of the balance between going in the practical order of the game and going in, you know, the optimal order of character progression. This sits somewhere in the middle. So anyway, this is the Stone Trader. Um, she will later on sell most of the titanite and stones you need for various upgrades. She's a big help. She's also the blacksmith's daughter. And she is needed for the final achievement uh, for NPCs, which is the Gathering of Exiles. Of so, oh, anyway, this is the end of the video. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Uh, okay. I know this probably seems a little disjointed, this commentary. I actually had to take a break midway through to take a phone call. So, sometimes it's hard to stop and then come back into a commentary. But I didn't really want to retake the thing because in the hour it takes to reshoot this one, that time could frankly be used to make another um, video entirely so definitely want to do a little more quantity if possible uh, also let me know if you guys are interested in some more editing on these videos you know what do you think would improve them better editing better content more clarity um, you know let me know so far if most feedback has been positive slash you know minor complaints nothing major but you know anything helps and as always I am happy to talk to you guys and thank you for watching my videos um, I appreciate your time and I'll see everyone next time